Hi, I'm Amy Servini. I'm Hilary Gardner. And I'm Melissa Stilianu. And, and we, we are Duchess. When we started singing together, we discovered that humor, collaboration, and yes, imperfection were essential ingredients for our signature style of harmony. We're setting out to explore what harmony means to creative people from all walks of life and to learn how they find joy and success in their chosen field. Along the way, there's sure to be laughter, storytelling, and probably hijinks. That's just who we are. We are very, very happy to be here this afternoon in the beautiful not exactly high above Lexington Avenue, but beautiful abode of the great Jessica Molaski, star of stage, screen, and radio, and the Cafe Carlisle, and unbeknownst to me, the visual arts as well. Oh, yes. A little bit of that. A little bit of that. Um, we're going to get to more about Jessica's new record, but um, but I'm an avid liner notes person, and I was reading the liner notes to your Joni Mitchell record, and I, when I saw that you did the cover painting... I was completely blown away. Oh, well, I've been a painter for since I was a kid, really. And I thought, well, Joni's a painter, uh, and she thinks of herself as a painter first. And I felt that the songs are very much like paintings, portraits, since, you know, that's why I called it Portraits of Joni. Yeah. So I thought, well, it would, you know, maybe it would be fun to homage one of her paintings for her album covers, which I did. That's amazing. I was, I was listening, I was telling the girls, I was listening to the record on the, the subway as I came up here, which was really great because it's a beautiful record. And it was also not great because I was crying on the train and <laughs> I was the strange, the strange lady crying in the corner of the subway. I was going to say maybe on, you know, the subway in New York, that's not all that yeah, exactly. strange. We've, we've all seen stranger. <laughs> but, um, I love Joni Mitchell as well. I mean, I sort of like so many people in the, in the world, especially girls, like we grow up listening to Joni and you're like, it's like, she's writing my story, but it's also very literally her story. And then the songs change and take shape throughout your life and mean different things. Um, and one of the, the tunes that really like sent me over the edge was the version of Little Green that you did uh, with your daughter, Maddie. Mm -hmm. like, it's so poignant, a mother and daughter singing that song together. You know, I dreamed it because we, this record came out of a, a performance I did for the American Songbook Series at Lincoln uh, Center, Jazz at Lincoln Center. And I uh, didn't really, all I could knew is at the time I had a 16-year-old daughter and you went, walked by her bedroom, you see how many of the guitars there are in there. <laughs> and you could kind of hear like guitars coming from below the door that was firmly locked, but I had no <laughs> idea what she was at, what she was actually doing. But uh, my husband, John, would go down and pick up the guitars and they were all these wild, open Joni tunings that she was making up herself or finding in the Joni songbook at 16. Wow. So I had this dream. I thought, wow, wouldn't it be really interesting because Little Green is a sort of singular song about a young Joni Mitchell giving up her child yeah. for adoption or a little baby. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to be on different planes and have a mother and daughter sing that song? And it just turned out that she sang it beautifully and played it beautifully. And yeah. we can hardly go anywhere anymore. People say, is Maddie going to be with you? Because I don't want to <laughs> come if she's not going to sing that song. So yeah, It's so beautiful. And and you're harmonizing too. I mean, I, I like tried to learn to harmonize to that album, to Blue, when I was a kid. So your harmony parts were like exactly what I was singing, you know, when I was growing up with that record. And Yeah, we didn't even just, think about it. Yeah. Same thing, it same here. It just happened, yeah. And then uh, just when I thought I was safe, you segued into Circle Game and Waters of March, which are also two songs that make me sob. So it's been a bit of an emotional afternoon <laughs> for me, but I thank well, you. Well, those songs, I mean, that just goes to show you how how dense and ripe those songs are. I mean, you, it's funny that you should say these songs are girl songs, um, because I think they are quintessentially a, a woman's perspective about love and and sex and that nobody had ever done before. No one yeah. was saying those things. Um, you know, no one was saying you're a mean old daddy, but I like you. And, yeah. um, mm -hmm. But I remember my first year, my first semester of college, I don't know if I was homesick or something, but I was kind of weepy in class one yeah. day. And this girl that I didn't know dropped me a note and said, you know, laughing and crying, it's the same release. Oh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and wow. I thought, oh, it's Jody. She's, she's everywhere. Oh, man. Wow. That's Our, amazing. The, sister, the, the sisterhood, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And another one of your great inspirations is Stephen Sondheim. Mm. And I was thinking, it seems like there are some real parallels between, I mean, at least... 
on a spiritual <laughs> level, maybe between Joni and, and Stephen Sondheim. I mean, there's so, there's there's so many words often, and they're so unusual in terms of form and structure. And and I, I just would love to hear about how you approach these songs and your approach to lyrics and what lyrics mean to you, because those two as songwriters, I think lyrics are just, their lyrics are astonishing. Well, it's funny you should say that because my mom worked at a radio station when I was growing up in very rural Connecticut, a little, little station. And this is when they played LPs. I mean, mm. That's how old I am. And if they had a little scratch in them or something, my mom would bring them home. And it was a very sort of diverse, uh, eclectic kind of station. They played folk music. They played had a Broadway guy on Sundays. And she brought home two records. One of them was Court and Spark. Mm. And the other one was a Little Night Music. And they both completely blew my mind and changed mm. my life. Yeah. But in terms of form, they're completely the opposite. Yeah. Because the thing about Joni is that She'll add a syllable. She'll not have a perfect rhyme. Right. Uh, and you have to sort of maneuver your way around that in, in terms of the phrasing. Whereas yeah. Sondheim, it is like basically like doing a crossword puzzle. Yeah. Uh-huh. There, are, it's, there are internal perfect rhymes. There are external perfect rhymes. Everything lands right where it's supposed to be. So I think that Joni's songs come more out of her being a singer and her speaking almost like you're doing a spoken a poet word. Or right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And uh, you, it's, the difficulty is to try to make them your own and not try to sound like you're imitating her. Well, I think... I think you succeeded. I was, I'm, I'm very moved by it. I've recorded three of the tunes that, that you recorded. And I, I think, and they're all these versions. Yes. Everybody's recorded Joni songs and they're always unmistakably Joni songs. And they're also always very different. Everybody's take on them. I mean, I guess breaking news, Joni Mitchell genius, but <laughs> well, <laughs> but, you know, everybody, everybody, because I thought literally thought, you know, well, first of all, cause I came from the theater world. And so, Jazz periodicals have have been. I wore them down with my love all, over these years. You know for what a ja, what jazz singing is, but um, <laughs> uh-huh, <laughs> but uh, I just kind of thought everybody was going to kill me for making this record, and I can't tell you how many people wrote in print. Well, this is a brave thing to do, but I feel like these are wonderful songs they deserve to be sung out in be, have new breath as you know our generation is saying like this is my gershwin this is yeah. i want why should these be kept in uh, you know under glass so yeah. uh, i'm glad that people are responding positively toward um that gesture yeah well and i think it is brave emotionally also i mean in that it's impossible i think to come at any of those songs and not kind of be exposed emotionally to do so on that level I would agree that it's it's a brave thing well being an actor I mean I remember when I was a kid I didn't know if I wanted to be an actor but I remember hearing Marcy and thinking Mm. it was sort of like the end of a doll's house like what happened to Marcy you know (laughs) where did she go where did she go west again you know yeah yeah yeah. Um, so she told those stories in a way that made you worry about the people like yeah. you know the last time i saw richard yeah mm-hmm. yeah 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 it's funny yeah. he drinks most nights uh, oh, with the big, house lights turned, turned up, bright. up bright and that's with the, the most TV depressing on. detail yeah, mm-hmm. yeah it's and the details. yeah you have tombs in your eyes but the yeah. songs you punched are dreaming you know like yeah. come on come on yeah absolutely and in that way that sondheim can do like you're always sorry you're always grateful i think mm. that Joni does that yeah. You have tombs in your eyes, but the songs you punched are dreaming. And that idea that you're, there's a happy sadness in everything, like both sides now, mm-hmm. is that. Yeah, definitely. And so is Little Green. Yeah. There'll be, there'll be, you know, birthday clothes and sometimes there'll be sorrow. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you brought up the, the theater and I, I'm very curious about this because they're very different worlds in a certain way. And you made a transition from... Well, you still do a lot of theater, but I mean, in, as in your life as a, as a singer, you've, you've crossed over a lot and mm-hmm. played in between these genres. And what was, it, was it being married to a jazz musician that really kind of spurred you more in that direction? Was it something you always loved? Well, even when I did Broadway shows, I did do a lot. I morphed a lot. I mean, I did played Mrs. Walker on Broadway. I sang that rock and roll score mm-hmm. from the Who's Tommy. Mm-hmm. I did, um, City of Angels, which was a right. bona fide Very jazz, jazz, jazz yeah. score, yeah. Br- brilliant, brilliant score. And then like, you know, the most happy fellow, which is an operetta. Um, so it was like, I always like kind of going back and forth. But then when I met my husband in a show called Dream, 
Johnny Mercer, right? It's Johnny Mercer. Yeah. I like to say that the run of that show was nine of the most wonderful days of my life. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, there was, a, uh, we had a particularly temperamental uh, leading lady, and, um, and it wasn't Margaret Whiting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the director of the show kept, the time was ticking and ticking and ticking, and the director of the show was like, just, you just go figure out, these are the songs I want you to do, and just go figure them out. And I'd heard John on The Tonight Show. Mm. And I was like, that guy in the corner, I'm going to hitch my wagon up to him because <laughs> I know he's going to play all the right chords. And so we started, we had, we came up with a bunch of stuff, a Moon River and uh, Skylark. And, you know, we were kind of sequestered in the, uh, and I would, you know, we'd come up with ideas and it was just so cool. Like I'd never met anybody that I just clicked with from a musical standpoint. So this was just like a natural progression that we would just take it uh, kind of on the road. That's and of course, when one. you're in Broadway shows, it takes five years for them to go from the workshop, the 12 workshops that you do, mm. to the stage. And it's eight shows a week. And then some, you know, buddy, some reviewer comes around and says, I really didn't like it. And you don't have a job anymore. So <laughs> right. I... I thought the idea of being able to control my life a little bit more was yeah. great. And it's just worked very nicely. Yeah. Were there any um, particular like, challenges that were posed by, by making the switch or by, by moving in jazz circles? Like what, what felt really different to you about going from being in a Broadway environment where every, I love the known quantity of that environment where you know exactly what you're going to do every single night. And there can be curveballs, but I mean, there are pretty clearly defined parameters. And I think for me, what is the scariest and also the most wonderful thing about working in jazz is that there aren't. <laughs> and, and I'm wondering if you have well, had that I, feeling as well. I did. I did feel a little like, um, I never, you know, there's a sort of mutuality. It's like being on a baseball team when you're in a Broadway show mm. where, you know, you, you suit up and you go, let's go guys. Yeah. And it's sort of, and then all of a sudden I was singing with a lot of great jazz musicians and there was sort of like that kind of, all of a sudden I started understanding that feeling of the chick singer kind of right. thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I got uh, a response yeah, yeah, from yeah. the chick singer, <laughs> which I was kind of shocked about where yeah. people would have ideas and I'd throw my idea in and it would be sort of like, no. <laughs> um, so I, it took me a while to break that down. Um, mm -hmm. And also to break down the idea that, you know, being a Broadway singer is not really the same singing as jazz right. singing. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really interesting to me. What, uh, what, I mean, I always think of Peggy Lee as a jazz singer. She didn't scat, totally. but she sang in great mm -hmm. time yeah. and, um, and right in tune. I don't know. What do you guys think makes a jazz singer? Oh, God. It's Ooh. such a tough question. It is. You know, my first record came out and someone wrote to me who knew me and said, you know, this is, it's really lovely, but it's not jazz. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. What about all the improvised solos that are longer than 16 bars? Like, wouldn't that automatically put mm -hmm. it in? And so, and I think the question has changed certainly over the last, when was that? That was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So there are enough of us doing whatever the hell we want at this right. point where they can't. And know. everything keeps morphing. Yeah. yeah. I but think I was a question of time though. I think what you said, you know, I think it's a time, time feel and it's hard if, if that swing thing is not happening, then it's hard to, to feel like you're in a jazz. But I know show. a lot of really great jazz improvisers who can't swing. And right. I think that yeah, I learned true. how to swing. First of all, I, I wouldn't be married to my husband, John Pizzarelli, if you couldn't at least strap yourself in and stay with those <laughs> tempos that they play. But, <laughs> yeah. but I think I did learn how to swing kind of from Stephen Sondheim because as Barbara Cook used to say, you got to launch your consonants when you sing his yes. stuff. You know, when you sing, pardon me, is everybody here? Because if everybody's here, you, and like, you kind of have to do the same thing when you're when you're swinging, you know, and doing an up-tempo. Yeah. Constance or some of those percussive Joni, tools. Yeah. Yeah. Those Joni lyrics, I noticed, you know, on some of those faster tempos on the, on the record. It's like, wow. Like dry I, can hear, I can hear and dry understand. Cl exactly. Cleaner yeah. from Des Moines. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. I think, wasn't, who was, wasn't it a Supreme Court justice? Somebody, it was, it was something about obscenity, being asked to define obscenity. So, well, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. That's sort of how I feel <laughs> yeah. about it. I hope it wasn't Clarence Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Now, this predated him, I think, by quite, I wouldn't quote that guy. But um, We actually sang for Clarence Thomas. Come on. I can tell you. I'll show you the picture. Um, we sang for the... The, every year, the Supreme Court does a musicale in the Supreme Court. And they all line up, and they're like, 
about as far away as you are. And there, and Justice Ginsburg with her beautiful little Stop. lacy gloves. And usually they have like a string quartet or something, but this time it was Barbara Cook and Barbara Cook wanted us to be there. And so, uh, yeah, we sang for, uh, for the Supreme Court. And it was the first time Clarence Thomas came uh, to the <laughs> musicale because he knew there was going to be jazz. And Barbara Cook came out and... Uh, I don't. I can't remember exactly how it happened, but Clarence Thomas was cl- clapping a lot, and she said, "Clarence, you better behave yourself this afternoon." <laughs> <laughs> that, so that's my Clarence. Everybody, Thomas story. we all have like strange gig stories. I think that is like the best, <laughs> the best <laughs> unusual gig story I've ever heard. It was that's pretty cool. Amazing. It was pretty cool. That's amazing. Barbara Cook. Oh, Barbara Cook. I loved Barbara Cook. I loved Barbara Cook. You loved her. I mean, I loved her from afar. You loved her from close. Well, it was just one of those things, you know. I just loved her so much. Uh, she was in that pile of scratched records in my basement in Connecticut. Mm. And um, I sang to her every night. And I think I kind of, that's how I kind of learned how to sing soprano. And, um, and I, of course, went to see her when she had her transformation into being like the greatest cabaret performer I ever saw. And then the first night we were at the Carlisle, which was the most terrifying night of my life because the New York Times comes and it's the first time you sang this stuff and you can hear everybody scratching in the dark. (laughs) It's so close. (laughs) And there she was, ringside. There was Barbara Cook. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to die. And I think I was singing like Buddy's Eyes or something. Oh God. (laughs) When it was over, we, we went up to our dressing room and there was a knock at the door and it was Barbara. Oh. And she said, oh, you guys, I'm so jazzed. Let me in. And she came in and sat with us for like an hour and just said, that was so jazzed. I get, it made me so jazzed. And that was it. We just became friends. And she just lived around the corner from here, so we would oh, really? go see her. Yeah, That's amazing. Yeah, a couple of years ago, we actually did what you guys do. We took our uh, microphones over and and talked to her, and I got to go find where that is. That's wonderful. That'll be... That will air at some point, probably, maybe. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) that's great. Well, speaking of the Carlisle, we have seen you guys at the the Carlisle perform. And it is what you do is is a New York that up until we saw it in person only existed in movies and my imagination. Mm. It is everything that's elegant and witty and it's very like Myrna Loy and William Powell, you know, it's, <laughs> it's this wonderful repartee and this old school elegance. And how did those Carlisle gigs come about? Well, Barbara Cook's manager is a fellow named Jerry Kravitz. I did a um, one show at the, El- at the Algonquin mm. in the Oak Room before it closed and he saw me and he was like, he would call me like twice a month and say, come on, come on now, let's go. We're going to have, where's your act? Really, your act? I said, I'm a housewife, you know, I don't have an act. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they said, well, I'm gonna, I think that you and John would be great in, in the car lounge. So I, we said, okay. And we walked out on stage and we would say hi and everybody started laughing. You know, something about being a married couple. Well, yeah. people, you guys have yep, such yeah. an amazing chemistry on stage. And I'm now sitting across the table from you. I'm seeing that it must just be that way in real life, that you guys are just <laughs> that Our deal hilarious is, and fun. We just say, we're going to sing this, this, and this, and we're going to talk here. But we never, we never say what we're going to say. Mm-hmm. And then if something funny comes out of it, then three nights later, it's the story is three minutes longer, but it, that's how it is. But it, we never sort of impose. It's mostly just like how, you know, we talk. Like, right. He makes me laugh. He's a really f- goofy, very funny. funny person. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and food is, is important in this house, if I'm not mistaken. Food is important in this house. Are, <laughs> you guys are cooks. Or is, mm. he, is he the main cook? Are you the main cook? Do you share the duties? It's the weirdest thing I ever saw. After September 11th, everybody for some reason came to our house for for nights. Like, I remember getting my uh, credit card bills. It would be like September 12th, 2001. The Uptown Wine Company, like three hundred dollars. <laughs> September 13th, you know, it was like everybody came to our house and drank wine. And my husband, who had never gone into the kitchen, went into the kitchen and just started making pasta. And it's been that way ever since. Mm. Yeah. He has a direct line to Mario to Batali. He's got, I mean, he, come has, on. Oh, he has people wow. making, leaving like lamb stock. It, yeah, you know, 
<laughs> He's worn down every um, restaurant tour in New York City. <laughs> That's my favorite That's amazing. Thing. That's yeah. awesome. So what's coming up? Uh, what's coming up next? I, I know that you guys do gigs all over the place all the time. Um, but in your like in your mind for your next project, is that fomenting already? No. <laughs> this is it. I got asked that question Fair. the other day, and that was kind of my answer too. <laughs> no, I mean, well, of course, I'm, you know, we're in the process of trying to put together our Carlisle show. Um, yeah. No, I don't know. I mean, I hadn't made a record for like eight years before this Joni Mitchell record, because I just felt like nothing was burning to come out. Um, I have a, you know, I would really like to do some theater again. I miss it. I don't like the, the two, doing a show for two years anymore. I like yeah. the idea of doing something at Lincoln Center for eight or nine weeks or something right. like that. But, you know, there seems to be a particular demographic that is somewhere between 50 and death that doesn't really exist <laughs> on the, <laughs> the stage right now. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to find my way back into telling everybody that I'm not, like actually old now. <laughs> it's, it's, we live in a crazy, crazy culture. It's true. One of the things we like to talk about in our podcast is how harmony is important to our guests. And for us, obviously, we are quite literally singing in harmony. Um, what makes our thing work is what, what are it? the lists? Laughter, collaboration and imperfection. Those are sort of the ingredients that have to become one in order for us to do what we do. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> I mean, imperfection in meaning that you don't strive for perfection because there's no such thing and they'll trip you up. Yeah, and it's being the human. mistakes are those, good. Those little yeah. moments yes. yeah. are just where right. a person's self kind of comes through and, and an audience will get on your side immediately. Yeah. And our, I have our, to make at least two mistakes every set, for example. <laughs> That's my rule. And I like to throw a little something their way to trip them up once in a while. So well, sabotage is one of your ingredients. Yes, <laughs> yes. I think that uh, also the idea that when you're collaborating and someone gives you, says, oh, I don't know about that, but what about this? Especially with my husband, I feel like I never feel like he's criticizing me. I always mm. feel like he's looking at my best interests. And I think that's just an, an interesting way to keep yourself in harmony with the other people, the collaboration that you have. Don't Absolutely. You think? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. listening. I mean, yeah. literally when you're singing harmony and figuratively, listening yeah sure. absolutely and that's a lot that speaks to a great deal of trust too being mm -hmm. able to trust that you're going to be having someone acting in your best interest and and that they'll that they can trust you to respond well and yeah and how do you um do you guys do everything together in terms of planning the shows or do you guys switch off like who's sort of in charge? Do you mean like with arrangements and everything? With everything, or? sort of. With yeah. with in. I mean, this in your musical life. Let's say. I would say it's a pretty much a fifty-fifty situation yeah. where we'll just sort of throw everything in a pile and then say, okay, let's. It's like sculpting. I have this idea. You have this idea. Let's see what this what this might come out, and then you start pulling stuff away, and yeah. it starts to get to be something. Yeah. Or I mean, honestly, like I would say, four times in our collaboration, we we've we've. we've both of us have had dreams. Wow. Really? That circle game with yeah. the waters of March, yeah. John dreamed it and woke up and wrote it down. Well, well we saw, mm -hmm. when we saw you in Toronto, that was a tune that, that you guys mm -hmm. performed. And we it, all, all talked us, about yeah, it as we left the theater. It was yeah. just, it is and was such a powerful, special moment. The songs are just, they're perfect together. But don't you think that that speaks a lot to listening to your intuition, which is harmony yeah mm -hmm. because those you know whatever's coming up in your subconscious he dreamed that yeah just yeah, like amazing. i dreamed my daughter singing little green with me yeah yeah um so you got to trust all that stuff too right yeah that's important that's so nice you know i wanted to ask you about because melissa and i are both canadian we're both oh, from toronto yeah. Toronto. And we saw yeah. you guys perform yeah, yeah. yeah. we saw you perform at in toronto Kirk Kirk Hall? Yes. yes was that for the thing the last jazz, year the jazz festival 2015 two when everybody sang a Canadian song and I sang mm, a no. Leonard Cohen song? It was the two of you. It was your show. Oh, okay. It was a Radio um, Deluxe yes. show. Yes. Maybe it was a live taping. With uh, Alex, Alex Penguin. Alice Penguin oh, yes. sat in. Yeah. She was a guest. I love that theater. It's Isn't amazing. It beautiful? Yeah. Sound is incredible. Incredible. Ah, yeah. <laughs> oh, Toronto. Yeah. So, yeah. Just FM. so my question is, I don't know. I, I left when I was 18, Toronto. So I have a sort of like, it's home, of course. Right. But I haven't been there 
since I was a child, really. I mean, I didn't grow up there as a, you know, do that, that important growing up between 18 and what? We're going to make it. Ne- These days, it's like 30. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so I wasn't there when you guys really started performing and have this connection with Jazz FM. What, where did that come from? I don't know. I mean, just there's certain cities that sort of get what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, we're on in Minneapolis now, and for some reason, they get, maybe it's cold places. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you stay in to listen to the you'll radio be, in cold places. You'll be very big in Anchorage next. You know, I, I don't know what it is, but I definitely, I enjoy performing in Canada as much as anywhere. You know, we do, pretty much do Montreal every year, and just an openness to way that, the way people receive what you're trying to put out there. That just seems to me, did I just say put out? <laughs> well it done. seems... <laughs> I don't know, less American, well, judgmental or mm-hmm. something. I don't know. I'm not yeah. putting down Americans, but there is just some a way, a warmth and a openness. That's all. I don't know. That's Maybe a sense of humor. Maybe. I mean, that's what it kind of, that, that comes with the cult thing because you have to entertain yourself I think, <laughs> because you're just inside for so many months of the year. Is it the same? Are there a lot of comedians coming from Alaska? There's a lot of suicide and teen pregnancy. Wow, so that's, I, the, you know, that's, that's, that's the, the flip extreme. side. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're on in Alaska. Um, but um, think about how many pe- funny people come from right. Toronto. Oh, yeah. It's like the center of humor. Yeah. And I think that really is part of I mean, there's also this self-deprecation thing where we're not quite as bad as Australia. Because I think the Australians <laughs> really like don't, they, they talk themselves down all the time. Australians, but in a very serious way, as in my experience anyway. Um, Let's find other countries to alienate to. Yeah. Let's just Where else? Down. Where else? <laughs> Israel? We can do that one. <laughs> my husband's from Israel, I'm allowed. Um, no, but, but I feel like that's, that's part of it, is that we have always been, as Canadians, the like the baby, the annoying baby brother or sister of the United States. Like you really feel that way when you live there. I did as a kid anyway. It just starts early that you're the underdog, which is just easy to make fun of. And And now everybody wants to live in Canada. Well, don't they? (laughs) I have a friend who's actually writing me saying, okay, so if I get a job offer, they're saying I can move. He's dead serious. Wow. Yep. Crazy, crazy talk. But yeah, I, I know that, I mean, my mom, for example loves every week she listens to you guys oh that's so it's, nice it's amazing that's just so nice yeah. well i mean you you know now and people feel like they know you because you they know you from your living room not from going to see you in a concert hall right they know you from making eggs on sunday morning you're in their home <laughs> yeah right. and yeah. It's, a, it's a different animal it's really quite lovely you know every once in a while when we're performing we have to tell people to stop talking to us <laughs> <laughs> like from, the, from say, the audience yeah because this is a show now because <laughs> you know they'll say well how did that you know how did that pot roast come out that you oh, made oh my room? gosh this is not q a time this is Wow. No, but we love that. But yeah. It's just great. Changes yeah, so everything. People know now that Melissa likes chocolate, so she'll get chocolate, you know. I know. Nice. We talk it's about pretty fabulous. On the yeah. 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 People, people do know a lot about the three of us, too. We should probably kind of monitor, monitor. More <laughs> yes. yeah, I know. a little. We are in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's a lovely, warm, and open vibe that you guys have on stage and, and on the air. Um, and Hillary makes a great point. It, it is... Uh, I didn't think of it this way, but but as soon as you said it, it's a real kind of New York thing that you do on stage. Um, it's really so relaxed and uh, and funny and not you know not super scripted. And you can tell that it's that that it's improvised and that it's um, that you know there's some points that you're hitting. But it's um, sharp though too. Yeah. There's something about the way that everything kind of unfolds. I feel like it could only be here. In, in New York City. <laughs> but I, I, there's something that it just has, it has a real identity is, is belonging to you guys, but also of a of that era, you know, wisecracking, wise brilliant cracking. dames. And well, you know, you try, well, there's nothing wrong with trying to be smart or, <laughs> or actually, you know, choosing text and material that has a brain and also a heart and a soul, mm-hmm. you know. And, and that's one of those you. places where, yes, where people want to go and be yeah. stimulated. You know, it was terrifying when I first did it because, you know, when you're an actor, you have, 
you're playing a part, you have a costume. And when you're in those small rooms, you just are so exposed as who you are and it's terrifying. But the more I watch other people do it, I realize the minute you tell a lie or the minute it feels trumped up, um, it's not good. Right. Yeah. Because you can see it. It's so exposed. So yeah, people don't buy it. Yeah. People, I mean, they don't, they don't come along for the ride. Because right. they can feel that you're not. Being yeah, sincere. we have two rules. We never sing to one another because that makes me totally uncomfortable. Uh. Like, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I I'm do it sometimes. 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 in the stream where you're gazing at each other. That was a really good, yeah. good visual for, for the podcast. Yeah. Um, good at that. Also, and the other one is no, like, ball and chain kind of references. Yeah. I, yes. I, I think the idea that you find somebody in this life and is imperfect as everybody's relationship is, that it's a gift and that the kind of honeymooner sensibility has never been one that I really like. And I think people really respond to that. The mm -hmm. people are, the two people are really good friends and happen to be married, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's showbiz. And I mean that in the best possible way because yeah. it's, it is authentic and it is true. I mean, we underestimate an audience at, at our peril. I mean, we being anyone who happens mm -hmm. to be in front of an audience, but there is something, this is what I've loved about your shows together. And when I've had the occasion to see John Pizzarelli perform on his own, there is this showbiz sensibility. It doesn't feel, you know, there's that jazz thing sometimes where everyone's like super cash and it all just kind of <laughs> yeah. feels like a rehearsal and like whatever, man. And like that, that has a vibe, but there is something about going and people are in suits and you know what the arc of, you know, that, mm -hmm. that you're in good hands. Yes. You're never nervous. Right. You, you don't know what's going to happen, but you know, it's handled. It's, it's a really, well, I think what feeling. you're saying is that he knows that he's providing a service for someone. <laughs> like when people say to me, like, oh, come on, you know, I had a director once say, like, oh, we're not curing cancer here. And I think, well, maybe we are, you know, maybe we are mm. for an hour. Maybe coming to see you guys sing and take, you know, maybe you are. And I've had, we've had people write us letters saying that, you know. Yep. And so that difference between going to see a bunch of guys jam who are doing it for themselves as opposed to say, I really want to provide, you guys have gathered here for tonight for something to yeah. happen. Is the yeah. difference, right? Well, I mean, kind of bringing us all back like full circle, we think about these Joni songs. I mean, they've saved they've saved my life. I'm sure mm -hmm. they've saved yours at various Laughing times. Laughing and crying, you know, it's the same release. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that feels like the perfect way to segue into the uh, Duchess questionnaire, I think. Oh, oh. yes. It's fun and easy. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh -oh. All right. This fall, is great. It falls on me. Mm -hmm. I'm the lucky one. <laughs> Jessica Malaski. Yes. <laughs> Where were you born? I was born in Waterbury Hospital in Waterbury, Connecticut, and grew up in a little town called Wilkett. Wilkett? Also yeah, exactly. in Connecticut? All right. Yes. Oh. No one's ever heard of it. No. Even no. people in Wilkett. <laughs> <laughs> Do they have any apple picking? Should I go there this weekend? They absolutely have apple picking. Yes. Okay. Good. I grew up, will it be less busy than the other ones on the list from Time Out New York? As a matter of fact, I don't know if this is possible, but somebody said on my Facebook page that there was a moose in the orchard the other day. Oh my goodness. A oh my moose gosh. Eating the apples. I didn't think they came this far south, but. Wow, that's, that's, that's awesome. That's where I grew up. Maybe Global scary warming. too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, what is your favorite drink? A lovely Chardonnay. Mm. Ah, Amen. yes. Do you have a brand? We we do wine. We do tasting sometimes. So we. Have to get no, some you know I can't. I'm, I'm changing. Okay. I'm changing from the heavier Californians into maybe like the lighter French. Mm -hmm. mm, that might be good for you for your pocketbook. Seeing yeah. the horrible things that are happening in California. I wonder. I'm really worried mm. about California wines after these fires. You know we. Um, have a couple of really good friends who own vineyards out there because every year we used to play the Mondavi Opera House. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the winemakers were very active in making sure that, that they had their friends come in every year. And already this year, because the summer there, there were like 110 degrees in the valley, he's, my friend said that their grapes were like raisins. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Before the fire. Before. Yeah. So unfortunately, I think there might be a thing called global warming. Yeah. Perhaps. Turns out... Yes, you heard it here, I'm folks. I'm sorry, I just brought the questionnaire down. No, 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 no that's okay. No. It's all right. We go up and down okay. a lot. <laughs> what song makes you dance? Oh, my God, I'm the worst. Well, <laughs> the Brotherhood of Man, the... Um, da -da 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 -da. The, the Oscar Peterson. Uh, I used to oh. dance with that with my daughter. Oh. Uh, all the time. Oh, when she was little. Nice. That's sweet. What profession other than your own would you like to try? Um... 
I think I'd like, in my old age, I would like to be a teacher. I've been thinking about that a lot lately. But I would love to just go like into my little cabin. We have a little cabin upstate and just paint for two months. Yeah. See what happens. Where where did the, the, the painting thing start for you? Was it always something you loved to do? I don't know. I, don't, I really don't know. My mom was kind of cool about bringing things into the house. Mm-hmm. And I think she did bring some, I think she sort of saw that I had some something going on there and uh, brought some oil paints in when I was little. But I don't really remember. Yeah, it's just always yeah. been there. That's so great. That's good. I should I should unlock the paints in my house and let Bailey have at them. <laughs> you I'm them a up. little well. I just How haven't old? shown them to him. He's four old? and a half. Oh, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He gets it at school a little bit, but I I'm a little bit. I discovered I'm a little uh, mesophobic as a mom, just a little yeah, bit. Well, Can you believe it? As a mom, you're probably the one cleaning it up. Yes, yeah, so. this is true. This is true. But but it's inspiring me to kind of also you know start. Well, I think doing I was a little myself. older than that. I yeah, think maybe I okay. was twelve. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I've got some time. That's good. Um, what profession would you not like to attempt? I would could never be an accountant. We have had that before. Yeah, I could. Yeah. Couldn't be a any. I went to my accountants the other day. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> I just saw these piles of papers, and I thought, "Oh my god, I could never do that." Yeah, well, me neither. Math. All the math. The math. Yeah. What makes you laugh? My husband. Mm. Yeah. Yes. He oh, he literally great. like I'll open my eyes and he'll say something, and I just he makes me laugh. And my daughter, she's really funny too, really crazy funny. <laughs> <laughs> what makes you cry? Um, the end of the first act of Sunday in the Park with George mm-hmm. never fails. Mm-hmm. And I did it. Mm. <laughs> and never could not get through it without crying. Oh. I, I love that musical and I love that your version of Everybody Loves Louis. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Sondheim um, came to see us. Um, he comes every year pretty much to the Carlisle, which is no pressure there. Yeah, right? <laughs> Barbara Cook, and, Sondheim, um, no worries. And uh, he said, why would anybody sing Everybody Loves Louie. I said, well, I did. I kind of like it. (laughs) Good for you. Yeah. I love that one. Um, What is your favorite place in the world? We have a dilapidated cabin that's 1,200 square feet on a lake, and it's 55 minutes from this apartment. And I'm going to go there today, and I'm going to stay there by myself for five days. And it's like (gasps) heaven. It's just heaven. That sounds good. See, glorious. you think you're going by yourself, but we'll just be trailing no, you <laughs> discreetly. 55 minutes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There'll be apple picking. Oh, and, you know, upstate New great. York is just, I mean, New York State, East Hampton. I used, we used to go out in the springs all the time, the Hamptons. But this little spot that we have is pretty great. Pretty great. Lake. Yes. I'm a big lake fan. Exactly. Yeah. The Canadians. Yeah. We just it's ha- just a place we, on we, the lake. Literally, it's a shack, but it's right on the water, and you wake up in the morning, and it's just like light coming it's great you're like what is that smell oh it's air, it's air. I know. Yeah. Just <laughs> wonderful and the greatest thing is that uh i have a lot of old old friends that um you know i did my first show when i was like 20 and um that was a long time ago and you know you make friends for life in the theater and they've all kind of slowly bought the properties next door oh so God. we sort of have this enclave where That's so nice. you know saturday nights we make dinner it's great That's it's really beautiful. great it's oh, amazing. Wonderful. Let's do that. Yes. Yeah, it's, let's do I it. highly recommend it. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's How some, far will we gigs. have to go to afford <laughs> <Yeah>. something? <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a little farther than 55 minutes. Maybe. We'll see. You know, we have some time. Big but we goals. bought we yeah. bought it a long time ago, so we were lucky. Because yeah, we'll never key. be able to afford it now, but timing. Exactly. We're just gonna find the new 55 minutes away. Yeah. We'll go 55 minutes a different direction. Uh-huh. No, like, this is the direction to go. Yeah, Just go. go so there. go 75 minutes. There you go. go. We'll do that. That's fine. Go up around Hudson, New York. What go do we need? Up like there. 400 cool. square feet for the three of us? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're not inviting our families. It's just oh, the three well, of us. Oh, well, that was what I was need, thinking. You need a space for Bailey and the paints. <laughs> I know. Well, I guess. Maybe oh, we'll let him have a timeshare. Then that's a different story. No, no. We think just, I have a dream that one day we'll have a little house. A duchess little, house. A little duchess abode. In Dutchess mm. County. Hey, we should. Yeah, there you they go. should. They should just give us one. See, that actually is that's our front, our front yard. Oh my goodness! Oh, wow, that really goes over well on the radio. Yeah. With us. Well, we do have a website, so maybe maybe we'll uh, we'll take a picture we'll of that. Take a picture yeah. of that. That's okay. I'm sure there's things online. I'll show you with it. <laughs> my eyes are not so good. Is that a, is that the prow of a canoe? Yes. Amazing. Oh, beautiful. 
love Jessica, it. Jessica, thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. Thank you guys for coming so fun. to the deluxe living room. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's very deluxe. <laughs> it is. It is. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Harmony and Hijinks. You can buy Laughing at Life wherever music is sold and through our website, duchesstrio.com. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Duchess Trio. And please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcatcher. See you next time on Harmony and Hijinks.